Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ali Kujuri, uh, and I'm one of the organizers of this uh, lecture series. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you all for uh, attending this, uh, this, uh, this lecture. Uh, I would like also to thank Adrian Technologies that uh, has uh, uh, been um, sponsoring this uh, lecture series since the start in 2006. Uh, before I, I uh, introduce our guest speaker for today, let me mention that uh, uh, on October the 20th, that's Thursday, October the 20th, the same time, uh, we have uh, a speaker, um, uh, uh, Dr. Dennis uh, Dickerson, uh, Chair of Electrical Engineering uh, Department, California Polytech Polytechnic State University in uh, San, uh, San Luis Obisto, and the title of his talk is uh, High Repetition uh, Rate Optical uh, co uh, Coherence to top, uh, Tomography Using uh, Single Chip Wavelength uh, Tunable Lasers. Uh, our guest speaker for today uh, is uh, Mr. Roger Stancliff, and uh, the title of his talk is uh, Beyond Electronics Exploring Microwave Measurement Applications in the uh, life sciences and uh, at the nanoscale. Uh, Mr. Roger Stancliff is a chief technical uh, technology officer uh, of uh, microwave measurements for Agilent Technologies Electronic Measurement Group business. His focus uh, is on uh, new technologies, applications, and research in microwave to terahertz uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, with uh, a special uh, emphasis on life science and uh, nanotechnology applications. He heads the University Collaboration Program for Component Test Division in, uh, in EMG and is uh, actively engaged in, uh, uh, in uh, match collaboration around the world. Roger joined Agilent previously uh, Hewlett Packard in 1973 uh, doing research and development in Santa Rosa. He holds, um, um, well, he has held a variety of magnetic, uh, ma I'm sorry, ma management positions in microwave uh, uh, signal processors, uh, spectrum analyzers, and network uh, analyzers uh, over the years. Roger graduated uh, with his uh, Master of Science in Electrical Engineering in uh, Microwave Electronics from Cornell University. Uh, in 1994, he received his uh, Master of Science degree in, in Management and of Technology from National Technological University uh, uh, in the United States. So here is Roger. <laughs> Thank you, Ollie. Uh, I'm gonna excuse the fact that I'm gonna sit down for this talk because I have some neck problems, but it shouldn't impact things too much. If you look over here rather than over here, you'll see what's really important anyway. So um, basically, my job for the last eight or nine years has been to be a scout or an explorer for the, the electronic measurement group of Agilent. And what I do in this regard is try to find new applications for measurement in markets that we don't currently serve. And I have to tell you, it's a fascinating job because I have to go around the world and visit leading research groups that are working in a number of new areas. And then I have to pick ones that I think would be lucrative for Agilent in the long term and then support research and try to stir things up to get it moving towards commercialization and money. Because really what the corporation about is about is money, um, though there's a lot of other things that come with it. So here's an outline of the talk. Basically, I'm going to talk about microwaves, measurements, and vector network analyzers to give you a little bit of foundation. You know, what are microwaves, what's a network analyzer, and then give you a little bit of history of this instrument, which is one of uh, the biggest categories in our company. Then I want to talk about some physics, new measurements for microwaves, and there's three words here that you'll walk away with a picture in your mind, small, wet, and changing. And because of this physics, we are finding application areas in medical, Homeland Security, Process Analytics, and Nanoscale. So, how many of you know what the electromagnetic spectrum is? That's great. Yeah, I, I figured you would, Don. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, the electromagnetic spectrum is 
things you can't see, and people will argue that maybe you can feel them depending on which part of the spectrum they're in, but they're all around us. And if you look, you know, your power line when you plug into the walls around here is 60 hertz. This is vibrations per second of the electric field and magnetic field that cause these electromagnetic waves. You get up into this region, radio waves, short waves, you're talking about your AM and FM radios and the beginning of the TV bands. And then how many of you have a cell phone? Everyone? <laughs> I would think at this point. Guaranteed. Yeah. Uh, cell phones operate in the uh, 900 meg, 1.8 gigahertz, and 1.9 gigahertz bands, I guess 2.1 now as well. And so they're at what I would call the very low end of microwaves. And then you can go up into satellite bands and point-to-point -point radios and r car radars and so on, and then up into the infrared, and then visible is around just below 10 to the 15th cycles per second, and then you get up into these higher energy things. So energy is increasing as you go to smaller wavelength, and there's sort of a dividing line here right around UV where radiation begins to knock things off of you, begins to ionize your body. That can create problems from cancer to whatever. Uh, below this kind of boundary, you have what you call non-ionizing radiation. Now, it's interesting, you'll see a lot of medical imaging is done with x-rays. And there's some danger to it, though they use fairly low energy x-rays in most of it. But a lot of what I'm exploring in this part of the spectrum uh, will do a lot of what this does, but without the risk that you have in x-rays. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about network analyzers, and I'll make an analogy to kind of an optical approach here. Um, a network analyzer basically sends out a signal or a wave and it looks at what comes back and it also looks at what's transmitted through something that you're trying to test or characterize. If you look at a network analyzer, basically we know what we're sending out, the sort of reference signal, and we know what comes back and so we measure a ratio of the reflected over the incident. And this allows us to calculate a number of things that become important for circuit design and also material characterization, there is something called S-parameters. <clears throat> How many of you know what S-parameters are? Wow, okay, that's not bad. But S-parameters are just one way of looking at impedance or looking at uh, wave properties of reflection based on a reference. And you also can look at the transmitted uh, wave and how it compares to the reference signal. And that gives you another set of parameters that characterize transmi transmission. So this is an optical analogy, but the electric thing that we actually build is really basically the same. This is typically coaxial transmission. Uh, instead of having a lens that reflects and transmits, we have things called couplers. And so we send out a known signal and we couple off some of the energy and that allows us to establish the reference signal. And then we have another coupler which looks, well actually this is, yeah, and we have another coupler that looks at the signal coming back which gives you the reflected signal, and so you can get a ratio. Now this is just looking at the reflected wave. If you want to look at the wave that goes through a device, you need to have another one of these on the other side to look at the transmitted signal. But an interesting artifact of geometry or reality is that when we build these systems, uh, they've got to be manufacturable. And it turns out that coax, when it's in a dielectric constant of two, Teflon, has a ratio of the center conductor to the shield around the coax of about three to one. And so this is very manufacturable, and that's why most of our instruments are 50 ohms in terms of their normal or characteristic impedance. Now, if you look at reflection coefficient measurement with a network analyzer, that's this. 50 ohms, by definition, is the impedance at which you will see no reflection coming back. If you have 50 ohms out here, you'll see nothing come back. But as you go above 50 ohms or below 50 ohms, you get more and more reflection off of the load. And you also see that the sensitivity, which is the slope of this line, is very high around 50 ohms, but it becomes much, much less as you go to much higher and much lower impedances. Now, when I start talking about nanoscale, you'll see that this lack of sensitivity at high impedance can create issues, and I'll talk later about some ways to deal with that. So here is sort of a history and, you know, after the passing of the uh, chairman of the board of Apple yesterday, this kind of brings back nostalgia because he started Apple right about here, 1975, 1976. 
But, you know, my story of why I came to Hewlett Packard is all about this instrument here. This was the first microwave network analyzer that Hewlett Packard built, the 8410A. It operated up to 12 gigahertz. And Cornell University received one in their microwave lab in 1971 when I was a student in the microwave lab. And I got to use the thing and I said, wow, what an instrument. I just took a two day slotted line pen drop measurement plotting on a Smith chart and did it in 20 seconds. Yeah. And I said, my goodness, this is really something. I think I want to work for these guys. So at any rate, I finished Cornell and I ended up working with these guys. This was a pile of equipment to do a very simple transmission and reflection S parameter measurement. This was a three rack high, so think six feet tall and a foot and a half wide, three bays with a mini computer and a bunch of these tube sources. And this whole system was an automated network analyzer. And for the first time, some of the math that is used to improve the measurement accuracy was brought in. This instrument here, which is what was a mini, well, actually a desktop computer in those days, and this one rack took over everything this did and did it in a much more compact and cost-efficient way. And this 8510 became the industry standard. And in fact, we're just now here in 2011 getting successful at replacing it with our newest model in terms mm -hmm. of doing everything that this could do. But then this whole set of stuff ended up in a single box by the mid 80s and continued to progress and progress and progress until we get to where we are today, where we're not only doing everything that this does in this box, but we're doing almost every other microwave measurement that there is. And so you can think of this instrument, and I'll show you in a second, doing multiple instrument tasks uh, in these days. So. Here is the picture of today, something called the PNAX. This instrument has a number of signal sources in it. It has a number of receivers in it. It also has a bunch of signal processing and conditioning and switching in it. And it's really more than just looking at the incident wave and the reflected wave and the transmitted wave. There's a bunch of very specific things that we can do that are geared towards what customers need to measure, amplifier tests, you can look at the gain compression, which is how gain of the amplifier changes as you drive it harder. You can look at the intermodulation distortion, noise figure harmonics, et cetera. So we can do all of this. We can also measure mixers now, where you look at frequency conversion devices. We can also now come up with a set of nonlinear describing functions similar to S parameters, which describe nonlinear devices in a way that allows you to reconstruct in a simulator the performance and get predictable performance for the first time. And this is based on actually measuring all the harmonics and reconstructing the waveforms and creating a new matrix, which is much bigger than an S parameter matrix, which includes all the cross harmonic terms. And so this is kind of a breakthrough and really taking off and helping people do a better job of designing things that are nonlinear. We have a fair amount of action going on in the computer industry because computers now are microwave devices. They operate at five gigahertz or four gigahertz and they have all kinds of problems getting those signals around through the backplane to the various boards in the computer and onto networks. And so they use our instrument to measure that stuff. Uh, we operate up to a terahertz now, which is 10 to the 12th hertz. And a lot of interesting research going there. And one thing that I'll talk more about today is that we're actually doing nanoscale measurements with this instrument now as well. So that's enough about sort of the electronics industry and how our instrument plays into that. Uh, it's one of the probably two or three most significant instrument types in all of communications and aerospace defense. But what I've been focused on is really this kind of new stuff, the physics of microwave sensing, how microwave measurements apply to material science and biology. And so this is where things that are small, things that are wet, and things that are changing come from. <coughs> so I, I don't know how many of you have ever looked through an optical microscope and tried to look at really, really small things. But there's something called the Bragg limit in imaging, which says that you cannot see with a resolution smaller than half a wavelength. And so if you think the wavelength of visible light is around, well, it's 400 to 800 nanometers to be specific, but call it a micron. So the best you're going to be able to see is half a micron. That's 500 nanometers. Now, cells are on the order of 10 microns, but a lot of the things within the cells are on the order of 10 nanometers. And you just can't see them with an optical microscope. So that same limit, if applied to microwaves, microwaves, you're looking at one to 10 centimeter wavelengths, and so your resolution is going to be really, really crummy. 
But that's what I call far field imaging. That's when you launch a wave and, and look at what comes back and try to make an image out of it. There's a different kind of imaging called near field imaging, which is where you don't launch a wave. You create an evanescent mode, which means you have a stable mode, which is at the frequency of your excitation. And that stable mode is contained by an aperture. Now, when you do that, your resolution is independent of wavelength now. It's aperture defined. So independent of your electromagnetic energy uh, frequency or wavelength, if you have a five nanometer aperture, you get a five nanometer resolution more or less. And so we took advantage of this. Back in early 2000s, Agilent was looking for a growth area and we kind of looked at nano uh, metrology and nano electronics and just nanoscale measurements as a real good growth area. And we started putting together a program to build instruments we actually bought a company that makes an atomic force <laughs> microscope. How many of you know what an AFM is? Okay. We uh, have yeah, we a couple here. You have an Agilent AFM, actually. It's Pacific <coughs> Nanotechnology, which we purchased. Nice. Yeah, so you have one of those. Um, but uh, just for the others of you, an AFM is like an old record player needle. It's a stylus. And you have a very precision X and Y scanner that drags the stylus or bounces the stylus over a surface. And the stylus is at the end of a cantilever, and you bounce a laser off the cantilever, look at the fringes of the laser interference pattern, you can measure the vertical position of the cantilever to angstroms. And so what you're actually doing is a topographic map of a surface where you know where you are in X and Y, and you're measuring Z to create a topographic map of a surface. Now, AFMs can do more than that because you can hook electrical instruments up to them, you can do force measurements and a number of things. But something that hadn't been done before we got involved with this was to actually do microwave measurements at the tip. So we took our network analyzer and we took this AFM. At the tip of the, this is a scanner. At the tip, the sample goes underneath. And this is what the tip or the nose cone looks like. And in this nose cone is a substrate and it has a cantilever and a tip. So what we did is we engineered a signal path down to here so that we could create an evanescent mode at the tip of the AFM. And then when this evanescent mode comes close to a surface and interacts with the surface, you get change in electrical properties. And so we use the network analyzer to measure those changes. And I'll tell you more about what you can do with that and show you some pretty pictures near the end of this talk. But fundamentally, we're beating the Bragg limit by using an evanescent mode, near field imaging, and getting some very, very interesting capability. For instance, this can see below the surface of a material, and the AFM cannot do that. Okay, wet. Water is a miraculous substance. We wouldn't be here without it. You can say that about other things too. But water is also a very interesting molecule. It's highly polarizable in an electric field. Dielectric constant is the measure of polarizability. And so at low frequency, water has a very high real part of the dielectric constant. It's very easy to make a wobble around in a field. Um, as you approach the microwave region, the water molecule can no longer follow the electric field, and so it begins to not be synchronized, goes through what we call relaxation resonance, and comes to a new low value. Now, the imaginary part of the dielectric constant is simply the absorption, and that shows an absorption peak at this relaxation resonance. Now, these arrows are temperature. This is a very temperature-sensitive phenomena, 0 to 100, 0 to 100. But the other thing that's interesting is that water, it's almost impossible to get totally pure water. There's always some ions in it, and the ions will create current in the electric field. And in fact, below a gigahertz, these currents can be quite high, and they make it impossible to measure the dielectric constant. So it's kind of like the current shields you from being able to see what the water's polarizability is, but most of these ions are heavier than water, and so they have dielectric relaxation that's at lower frequency, and so they fade away. By the time you get to a gigahertz, the ionic currents are gone, and you have a small region here where the dielectric constant of water is high and the ion currents are not in your way so you can actually measure it. And you know, you look at 70 and 80 dielectric constant of water, most other substances in the world are below 10. And so the ability to see the high dielectric constant of water in other materials allows you to make some very good moisture measurements and that actually can be the surrogate for a whole bunch of things like tumor detection, which is based on vascularization or actually moisture content of the tissue. And this is one way that you can actually see cancer. So I'll talk more about that. But this sim simple property of the water molecule leads to a lot of interesting applications. And then changing. So our network analyzer can measure 
the S parameters or the reflection in 10 nanoseconds. And so if we measure every 10 nanoseconds, we can watch things change. And one example, we did some work at University of Washington Center for Process Analytic Chemistry where we looked at chemical reactions with a dielectric probe. And as the chemistries change, the polarizability changes, at least in most materials, and you can actually watch the progression of the reaction. Instead of taking samples out every 10 minutes and sending them to the liquid chromatographist, you actually get a real-time measurement. And this can be quite important for some people. It's interesting that microwaves are used commercially in chemical process these days to speed up reactions and make them cleaner. There's a company called CEM, and I'll show you their product later, but they basically just add microwaves to chemical reactions and get orders of magnitude speed up in the process, as well as cleaner results, better reaction completion. And this is very, very interesting. It's possible to monitor this uh, by measuring dielectric changes. Now, this third area is we have a research group in Linz, Austria at the Johannes Kepler University Biophysics Institute, and they have our microwave microscope, and they're trying to do some cell measurements now. And I have this kind of vision or dream that you have a cell in a petri dish or maybe in vivo later, but you have a live cell, you bring the AFM tip down to the cell, you put a voltage on the tip which opens a pore in the cell wall, and then you image it with microwaves and watch ions swimming in and out, which is the way that cells actually communicate is by exchanging ions. And so it's our dream to actually image that, which has never been done before. Uh, there's a number of things we have to do before we can really do that, but that's our goal with the Lens research. So kind of fascinating stuff. Okay, so now let's talk about how that physics enable actual applications. So there was a big study done between the University of Wisconsin and the University of Calgary. And what they did is they went to the, uh, the two medical um, clinics that they have in those two universities, and they set up a microwave lab next to the breast cancer ward where they do the breast cancer lumpectomies. And what they were trying to do was study the microwave properties of excised tissue from a cancer surgery and compare it to biopsy. And so they did this at the two locations. They used the same protocols, basically measure the tissues within minutes of excision and compare them, correlate them to biopsy. And they published this study, here's the reference, uh, in 2007, they're still working on this, but they measured over a thousand samples and showed a very good correlation between microwave dielectric properties and cancer versus no cancer. And so this suggests that you've got now a non-invasive or perhaps invasive, depending on what you're trying to do, method of looking at cancer, particularly in the breast. Now the breast is special because the dielectric constant of most of the tissues in the breast is fairly low and the cancer can be quite high. There are other parts of the body where there's more muscle and it's much harder to differentiate. So the breast was a good target to start with. But what's interesting is there's a company in Israel called Dune Medical, and you can go to their website, which is shown here. They have an instrument which uses a probe during surgery. They call it the margin probe. And so a doctor goes in and makes an incision into the breast, takes the lump out, measures the lump with the probe, to see if there is non-cancerous tissue versus cancerous tissue on it, and then put the probe into the wound out of which the lump came, check the margins, and then decide if the cancer is gone or not. Now what's interesting is if you don't use this instrument, uh, about 30% of the women who have breast surgery have to come back for a second surgery because the surgeon didn't get it all and the biopsy said there's still cancer. With this tool, that number drops by more than a factor of two, and I'll show you a little more detail on that in a minute. And then the same concept can be applied to imaging. So when you image the breast with a mammogram, you're using x-rays, and x-rays have a hard time traveling through the breast, so they squeeze the breast between two plates to try and shrink the transit, and that's painful. And the x-rays are really only showing density differences, which is not a total correlation to cancer. So using microwave imaging, uh, there's three groups in particular around the world that have been working on this. You can do uh, reconstruction of an image of the breast based on dielectric properties that has promised to be better than mammography. But to be honest with you, anything in the medical world takes a long time to make happen because mammography is the gold standard. You've got to prove that you do everything that mammography does and then more. So these things are not moving super fast. Here's the dune stuff. This is the probe that the surgeon uses. The tip of the probe has, again, an evanescent microwave mode. This operates in the uh, hundreds of megahertz to a gigahertz, and this has a pressure sensor as well, so you get a good contact before you get a measurement. 
There's a button here that the surgeon pushes and he gets both a green light, red light, and an audio indication of whether there's cancer or no cancer. This console includes an Agilent network analyzer down inside here, standing on its rear feet. And this console here is just to record the measurements so you have a record. And if you look kind of at their picture of normal tissue versus cancerous tissue, you see there's some structural issues in the tissues themselves that lead to differences in the signal as well as the moisture content. And this is the clinical result, 56% reduction in second surgery based on having a tool like this. And I'm, I'm actually amazed it's not better than this, but this is still a very good result. And they are uh, in the process of getting FDA approval now. This is actually being sold in Europe and has EU certification already. Yeah. Roger, yes. I a question. In the previous slide, uh, 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 when they are doing the probe, is it that they need to go around and call, I mean, to find, to find the, because they, they really need to identify the area which is most concerned. Yeah, so it's like a sphere. So yeah, so you've got to put it into multiple places to measure. Yes. And they call them sectors, yeah. and they mark the, They have sectors in their yeah. brain of what the you know what where they need to measure. Yeah. So maybe it takes eight or twelve measurements to get everything. Yes. Now uh, in that in the area, basically there, there would be a lot of let's say blood and other things on. There's there's also other sources of uh, of moisture. So how can they uh, basically uh, do this thing and then identify it properly? Well. <laughs> Good question, but the clinical result is the clinical result. So I don't have a good answer for you, um, except to say there's not a lot of blood flow in the breast, except in the area of the tumor. And so I don't think that once you take the tumor out, there's not a whole lot of blood that builds up. But again, I'm not a doctor, so I- they can also suck the blood I mean, around. Because yeah, you could use suction to get it out of there. Suction. But the, that may be one of the reasons this is not 100% effective why it's only 56% effective, that you have confounding variables like that that make it a little bit hard to see. Yeah. So, good point. Yeah. Okay, so two things off their website, news things. They submitted their PMA, something medical application, uh, to the FDA in April. In May, the FDA looked at the clinical results and said, we want to put this on the fast track, which means by November they should have approval. And they also have a study on their website that shows the actual results that lead to that 56% number. So we're expecting that within the next couple of months, this will be available for operating rooms. People will start buying them, and we'll start selling more network analyzers. Uh -huh. And how expensive uh, would they be? Uh, the console is about $30,000, and yeah. the probes are about $1,000, and they're disposable. So the real revenue for Dune will come from multiple surgeries and selling the probes. And we only get one shot per console. But even so, it's still a good, still a good business model. Yeah. This is an example from University of Bristol of a breast imaging system. And this works in a combination of radar and tomography, if you want to think of it that way. Each of these things that looks like a dime is an antenna. There's a big switch matrix down here which routes the network analyzer signal to pairs of antennas so you can do transmission and reflection measurements and do all the multiple paths through the breast. Now this is integrated into, an into a table that the woman would lie down on and have her breast in that cup and the measurement would happen. So they're doing uh, clinical trials at the University of Bristol Hospital right now and getting some pretty interesting results. Their website again is macrima.com, so you can go and look at what they're doing. Okay, some more things. Okay, so two diseases that are pretty big impact. Um, so stroke, there are two kinds of stroke you can get. Hopefully none of you ever get either of these, but the two kinds of stroke are ischemic. And ischemic, what happens is you get a clot in the brain and the blood flow reduces. So the brain basically dries out. And the other kind of stroke you can get is a hemorrhagic, where you have a burst like an embolism, aneurysm, whatever, and the cavity fills up with blood. So if you think about those from a microwave perspective, the brain's either drying out or it's getting wetter. And so the microwave signal can see that change in moisture trend very quickly. Now the way that stroke treatment happens today is someone has a stroke, they call 911, the ambulance picks them up, takes them to the ER, they go into a CT machine, which is an X-ray um, computed tomography. Two to three hours after the incident, they get a diagnosis and they know whether to put TPA in there to bust the clot or drill a hole and pump the blood out. So uh, that's two or three hour delay in treatment. The vision here is to have a microwave instrument in the ambulance where you can 
take the measurement in the first five minutes and begin treatment, even on the way to the hospital. And with stroke, the, the rapidity of treatment correlates to the success of recovery. The faster you can get to the, to the problem and solve it, the better the recovery will be. So that's one, that's a big deal. I'll show you details about these. Lung moisture. Okay, the number one Medicare expense in the United States is something called congestive heart failure. What congestive heart failure is, is in older people, the heart's been pumping for years and years and years and it's getting weaker. And so what happens is it can't <coughs> pump the volume of blood that the body needs it to pump. And you get a backup, basically a backup of moisture since blood is mostly water, which then collects in the tissues, but it collects a lot in the lungs because the lungs are right there next to the heart. And what happens is as the moisture accumulates in the lung, creates more pressure on the heart, which slows the heart down even more, which creates more backup of moisture until you get to a critical situation of heart failure. Now, the kind of moisture change that you see in the lungs is on the order of 100 milliliters. Think of 100 milliliters, that's like three ounces of weight. Now, the way that people monitor these patients today is to ask them to step on the scale every morning and record their weight. And your diurnal variation in weight will be more than three ounces every day, even without moisture buildup. So it's a very poor metric. So what we're talking about is a microwave measurement that can see a five milliliter difference. So much, much smaller and is not confounded by the other things going on in the body. And use this as a real time monitor so that if moisture begins accumulating, you can apply diuretics or some other approach to stabilize the patient and keep them out of the hospital. The big Medicare expense comes from readmissions into the hospital. The, the person just keeps building up and then they go in the hospital, stabilize them, send them home, then they build up again and it just goes over and over. So if we can eliminate that by having some sort of way they can stabilize themselves at home, that would be great. So news from Med Medfield Diagnostics. Medfield's first clinical study was stroke finder R10 and it started with a high pace. And, okay, Swedish Minister of Enterprise, right here, with his cap, with 12 antennas. These are all microwave antennas. This instrument operates from about 500 megs to three gigahertz. And again, you're doing a combination of reflection and tomography here. And so you're doing more than just measuring the moisture. You're actually getting some imaging information that tells you where the moisture is changing and so this is in early clinical trials in Sweden right now, and it looks pretty promising. Again, behind this Medfield front panel is a network analyzer and some switches. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the lung moisture, and this is a project that I personally sponsored at University of Hawaii, and this is from a paper that um, Magdi actually gave in July at the Antenna and Propagation Society. Um, so, basically, um, you're trying to do a wideband signal, a microwave signal, um, into the body to look at moisture buildup in the lungs. This is an example of an antenna design. It's basically a coplanar line with a resistive load. Think of it as a resistively loaded dipole or something similar to that. This goes on to the body. This is reflection coefficient, and this means that most of the signal is actually getting into the body over this frequency range from half a gigahertz to four gigahertz, and this is the interest interesting range for the moisture measurements so very good antenna design just slaps right on the body and you can do some measurements they built a simulation of what they're trying to do here by putting a balloon between two sponges um, muscle phantom and then the microwave applicators here and they did some transmission measurements and some reflection measurements as a function of moisture in the sponge and also using the balloon as a lung to look at breathing and so on and so they played around with that for a while. And you can actually see these signals. This, I guess, is the respiration rate, looking at the time frame here. Uh, in, yeah, that looks like breathing. And then what you see is a change here is moisture change. And so they're actually, and you will actually see heartbeat in here as well. I don't know why I don't see it on these. But this is from that phantom thorax experiment. And then they went over to the medical school and they have this programmable mannequin, which they can make it breathe, they can change moisture content, and they can do all that kind of simulation under computer control and use our network analyzer and do these measurements. And again, you see similar things where respiration rate changes and you see the cycles change and all this kind of stuff. So basically with this one microwave measurement, you get heartbeat, you get breathing, and you get moisture accumulation. 
So you can think of it as a vital signs monitor plus a moisture monitor. And if you think of the idea of having a very, very small microwave transmitter receiver, basically a network analyzer, but more like an iPhone size, someone could wear that on their belt, have this applicator, and have wireless to the internet to their doctor looking at vital signs and moisture buildup and get rid of your scale, because now you got something that really works. And basically where they are is they've made a lot of progress. They've got this wonderful antenna they're using. They've got institutional review board approval for human trials. They've experimentally uh, validated some DSP algorithms that they needed to digitally filter out the various signals, phantom experiments, and they're getting ready to do clinical trials. So pretty exciting. We're also working with a company in Israel that's on this same path. Okay, that's medical. There, there are some other things starting to emerge, but those are the major ones, and if you think about those, they're all really based on the water molecule and the interaction with microwaves, and that's pretty exciting that you can do all those things. Homeland Security. So 9-11 happened, and we all got worried about different kinds of threats. It used to be knives and guns. Then it became explosives that you can't see with metal detectors. And so a number of groups around the world started working on different imaging modalities that would see these new kinds of threats. Well, Agilent was one of those, and we actually built a microwave imaging system. Uh, this operates at 24 gigahertz. This is a big lens. It's an electronic lens. It's made up of a bunch of antennas here. These are patch antennas. There's 22 by 22 patch antennas. Each one uh, is 24 gigahertz, but each one has an FET switch on it, which you can either short to ground or leave floating. And so it's a zero or 180 degree phase shift from each of those antennas programmable by switching an FET. So there's 30,000 antennas here, one by two meters, and you shine 24 gigahertz on it, code it up to focus it on a point in space, get a reflection back from that point in space into the array and into your receiver. And then you change those codes very, very rapidly and you can image a one by one by two meter volume at 20 frames per second. Very, very fast, real time, millimeter wave imaging. Well, okay, so what? You know, what do you see? Well, that's where it gets interesting because at 24 gigahertz, the skin looks like metal and the clothes look like air. And so what you see are things between the skin and clothes. You also see more of the body than someone might feel comfortable with and there are ways to address that as well. But this was the early version. So you can see things like a ceramic knife, like TNT and like C4. None of these would set off an alarm in a metal detector. So in fact, Systems like this are in use today. We did this work back 2003 to 2006. Agilent decided not to commercialize this, but we licensed it out to a major homeland security player who now has it in the market. And there are two different versions of millimeter wave imagers that you'll find in airports. And there's a couple of different versions of X-ray backscatter, which are also used and give very similar images. But I think our CEO made a very good decision when he said, I'm not going there because when I start reading about what terrorists are doing now, they're trying to conceal the explosives below the skin. <coughs> so they're doing implantable explosives, and you couldn't see that with either x-ray or millimeter. So every time you come up with an advance in your ability to fight terror, there's gonna be counter action on someone else's part. And actually, just as an editorial, I think the Israeli approach of psychological profiling is probably gonna be the most successful way to keep people safe, and more of that's starting to happen everywhere too. So, very exciting technology. It's usable for things aside from this as well, uh, and we have a nice patent portfolio here, but we haven't really done much else with it, except it's nice for talking about because it's really cool technology. <laughs> so, third area, process analytics, I call it. So, in 2003, the Columbia Space Shuttle took off, and you know those big tanks it has on it. Those big tanks have foam around them to keep the liquid oxygen and hydrogen insulated so it stays liquid and you can use it as fuel. Well, in that takeoff, some of the foam broke off and hit the heat shield tiles and knocked some of them off the wings. So that when the Columbia came back down, the wings were exposed, it heated up and exploded on reentry and seven people died. And they did trace it back to this foam. This is the space shuttle foam. And so we said, okay, we think we might be able to do something here with inspecting this with microwaves. So this is a network analyzer operating from 220 to 325 gigahertz, doing a transmission measurement in free space, basically two horn antennas. And on the network analyzer, we can see the different sizes of voids. So based on this study, NASA bought one of our systems, 
put it at Marshall Space Center in Huntsville and started using it to try and develop a better foam application process and also to inspect the tanks. Well, in about a year and a half after the Columbia blew up, they started putting the shuttle up again. And from that time until the shuttle ended this year, there were no more accidents. And so I think our network analyzer helped NASA a little bit. They were also using some terahertz systems from Picometrics and some other approaches as well. But uh, this system did seem to be quite useful for them. Another area, pharmaceutical industry is a huge industry. And pharmaceutical compounds have moisture sensitivity. And so there's issues in moisture content during pharmaceutical manufacturing, also for packaging when you want to ship those things around the world. Most of the active pharmaceutical ingredients are moisture sensitive. They degrade if they get too wet. And so there's a big need in pharma, in quality control and manufacturing to measure, measure moisture. <coughs> well, Lubomar Gradnarski is a guy from AstraZeneca, yeah, here we go, in Sweden, who has been looking at microwave techniques and has been working on this for several years. And we work with him, in fact. And he published this paper. Now, the way that they used to measure moisture, and actually still do in most cases, is something called Carl Fisher titration. Any of you know what that is? Well, it's a horrible thing, actually. You've got to take your tablets and crush them up, and then you put them into this reaction chamber, and you start dripping potassium iodide or some nasty chemical. And what happens is that chemical grabs the water out of the material, and you have a potentiometer you're measuring conductivity. As soon as the last water molecule is gone, you get a, a zing in your meter, which tells you, okay, you're dry now. And so you know from titration exactly how much moisture content was in there. But some of the waste materials are horrible. Uh, it's destructive test on the tablet. Um, the fact that you have to mash the tablet up first means you've got a huge surface area, and if there's moisture in your ambient environment, it can change the actual water content of the tablet. So it's potentially a flawed technique. It, they have controlled it so that it's a pretty good technique. But it takes, you know, it takes a few hours plus whatever the queue time in the laboratory is to get your results. Well, with a simple microwave measurement using a resonant cavity and about a one second measurement time, you correlate very beautifully to a well done Carl Fisher titration. And so this is intriguing. People like this. Now you can get your tablet back when you're done and use it for something. You know, it's not destructive and it's instant and it doesn't use any nasty chemicals. So this is starting to take off and we're uh, developing some stuff in this area because it looks like a good opportunity. Now, this was a prototype of what we did where we took a TE331 or, or three modes of standing wave here in this waveguide cavity, iris plates on the two ends. There's a hole here and a guide for you take a Teflon like a straw and put the tablet in it, slide it in, take your measurement, take it out. And this could potentially be done even with a feeder and you know, pneumatic or something to shoot your tablets through there and get the measurement. Uh, this is our standard network analyzer. This is this. When you go into a pharma lab, you don't see any equipment like this. What you see is something that looks more like a copier. Blank face. It's got a hole and a start and a go no go light and a button. And so we're in the process of building an instrument that has no buttons, no display, except for, um, you know, no display at all. It'll just be a blank box with a hole in it. And then you'll put USB to a laptop and that'll show you your moisture content. So that's going to be a much better fit for pharma. Uh, they get confused with all these buttons. I think most of us do too. <laughs> okay. So there's another place where moisture content is important. And there's more than these two examples, but these two are ones that we're actively working on. Cement. In cement, you've got some, you know, some solid stuff and then you've got some water. And the idea of the water is that you're going to cause the solid stuff to bind. But there's a certain number of binding sites in the solid stuff. And so there's a certain amount of water, which is optimum for getting optimum binding. If you have too much water, then what's left over has to get out and you get porosity. If you have too little water, you don't get complete binding. And so you need to do a moisture measurement. And the way that cement industry does moisture measurement is something called loss on drying where they take the slurry and they weigh it, and then they heat it to get rid of all the moisture and they weigh it again. And that tells them what the moisture by weight was in that material. Well, that's a destructive test and it doesn't happen very quickly. So again, using a microwave method, here's the loss on drying and here's the microwave method and we get a very nice correlation. Why there's error here, I'm not sure, but it's still very, very tight correlation. And this is something you could potentially uh, have a handheld instrument that you'd stick in your cement truck mixer and tell whether the stuff's mixed right or not. And that way you'd know whether you're going to get a good cement pour or not. 
So this looks like a very interesting market, working with a researcher at Baylor on that one. Okay, I mentioned the microwave acceleration for chemistry. This is basically a dedicated microwave oven, 2.4 gigahertz cavity. Um, these are the reaction vessels. It's a microreactor. They go in here, turn on the microwaves, and make the chemistry happen fast. Well, the problem with this right now is that you have to try different times of microwaves for each reaction to figure out the protocol of what you're really going to do. It's an open loop instrument. So what we're proposing is to put a network analyzer at an offset frequency in there to actually see what's going on. Now the problem is this is like a $20,000 instrument and our network analyzers are typically that much or more. So it's not really fitting this market yet, but we're also working on much cheaper network analyzers, much smaller, that if we can get them down to 100 bucks, they fit in here very nicely. And my dream would be to get one for a dollar that would go into each one of your microwave ovens and tell you when the food's defrosted. So there's a lot of opportunity if you can do integration and cost reduction in this technology. Okay, now the final part here is to talk a little bit about nanoscale measurements. And I can see I've got just about enough time to do it. So this will be quite technical, but I think you'll see some pretty pictures at the end. So this is about vector network analyzers, problem of measurement and calibration at the nanoscale. I already mentioned a little of this. Nanoscale devices are typically very high impedance. Network analyzers are optimized at 50 ohms. So you get low sensitivity of measurement. Probing solutions for the nanoscale don't exist, but yes, they do exist because there's a thing called an atomic force microscope, which is basically a probe. So if we can connect to that probe, we now have a nanoscale probe. Calibration standards, when you use a network analyzer, you typically calibrate with some known impedances. Turns out you use a short circuit, an open circuit, and 50 ohms. But at the nanoscale, these things don't exist, so we need some other way to calibrate. But we have two technologies we've been working at here in Santa Rosa. One is the arbitrary impedance network analyzer, and the other one is the microscope. So I showed you this picture before. Um, not much to say about it except high sensitivity, low sensitivity, and most nano devices are up here in impedance, so that's a problem. But we came up with a technique which allows you to recenter the high sensitivity region of the network analyzer. Basically, what we're doing is building an interferometer or a reflection canceller. So we take some of the incident wave and some of the reflected wave into a differential amp, adjust amplitude and phase to create a null here for whatever impedance you put here. And so basically, if you put 50,000 ohms here, that's a thousand, you know, three orders of magnitude higher than 50 ohms. So with this technique, you can cancel all that reflected energy and make the ADC think that you're seeing 50 ohms because there's no reflection anymore. And so what that does is it puts you back here, but now this reads 50,000 for a reflection measurement at least. So now you're in the high slope region of the network analyzer. You're able to see one ohm differences around 50,000 ohms, which is something you want to do and something you can't do without this trick. Problem with this trick this only works at one frequency, so you have to readjust it every time you make a different frequency measurement. It's very, very sensitive, so it's hard to make a metrology-grade instrument out of this. So we came up with a much simpler, not quite as good, but effective technique for doing something very similar. And that is, how many of you know what a Smith chart is? Oh, wow, <laughs> I'm impressed. Okay, so this is a Smith chart. Smith chart basically takes the whole impedance plane and puts it inside a circle and allows you to do some interesting, uh, used to do it with one of those, what's that pencil with the Pressure. stylus? Oh, the the uh, stylus. No, 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 no. no. Uh, you know, you draw circles with it. Compass. Oh, yeah, compass. Compass, compass. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Used to do little compass constructions on here to oh, figure right, out how yeah. to design circuits. Yeah. yeah, whatever. But what we do here is we have a line of length down to the thing we're trying, line length down to the thing we're trying to measure and a 50 ohm termination back here. Now at DC, this line has no length, and so we're at 50 ohms. When your frequency goes up to where this is a quarter wavelength, you're now over at a short circuit. And when this becomes a half wavelength, you're coming back through 50 ohms. So what you've basically done is transformed an open circuit to the center of the chart. So 10,000 ohms is pretty near an open circuit on that Smith chart. And so all your high impedances are mapped into the center of the network analyzer's sensitive range. Now, again, it's a reflection null at one frequency. And so at roughly 1.9 gigahertz, you have this state where you have very sensitive measurement. 
Now this will recur every time you repeat a half wavelength here. So you have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. You can actually measure up to 20 gigahertz with this instrument. But this is the way that we do our imaging with the microscope is we run the network analyzer through this null and look at the null shift as a function of impedance perturbation on the surface of the sample. And so that allows you to convert that into an image. Okay. I showed you this before. Um, okay, now let's talk about calibration. We don't have shorts, opens, and 50 ohms. So we started a project several years ago with NIST in Boulder, and here's a citation about doing capacitance calibration. What they built was a highly doped silicon substrate, put different heights of SiO2 on it, and then different pad sizes on each staircase. So they built three or four orders of magnitude capacitance centered in the femtofarad region, which allows us to touch the AFM down to each of those and draw a cal curve because those capacitances are defined geometrically. So you know exactly what they are, assuming you can measure the geometry. And then you now have something you can convert to a calibration curve for the instrument. So now we can do absolute capacitance calibration. We did some collaborations in Europe where we looked into measuring doping. Now, if you think about doping in semiconductors, the more doping you have, the higher the conductivity. And so your capacitance measurement correlates to your doping measurement through that, uh, through that fact. And there is a group in Belgium called IMEC that makes a doping standard where they've characterized it chemically and so they know what they're doing and they give you the sample which has a bunch of different doping values and known geometries. And so we can use that to calibrate for doping concentration. So here's a citation about those measurements. Now people can use our microscope to do doping profiling across a wafer. And then we don't know what calibration for like cell measurements, you know, living cell measurements is going to be, but we're starting with capacitance as a surrogate and we'll figure it out later. But the first publication on cell measurements just came out, I believe it's in September ultra microscopy this summer again from our team in Linz. So now we're going to go to the photo gallery. These are images from the AFM. This is DCDV, which is the bias tip on the microwave microscope. And this is just a, a simple microwave measurement. But what you see here is SRAM transistor cells. And so look at transistor numbers are here. If you look at transistor 50 versus 48, the AFM image looks the same. But if you go down to this DCDV image, look in this area where the red triangle is there. Actually, you use the milder laser, it probably work better. Look in this area and compare that with that. What you see is this brighter area, which is the N-type dopant, has spilled across and knocked out the P-type dopant. And so your transistor is not viable anymore. And in fact, it turned out in this SRAM, number 48 was bad and they didn't know why. With the micro microwave microscope, they could see a little bit below the surface and see that indeed they would had doping spillover, which shorted out those transistors. So we're seeing a fair amount of uptake in failure analysis in semiconductors and now with the doping in some process measurements uh, with this instrument. Now these images are even more fun. So this is a zinc chrome alloy and this is the atomic force microscope image. You see like a mountain on the surface and then you see a little bit of stuff going on here. But if you go to either of the microwave images, you see that mountain, but you see a tremendous amount of detail underneath the surface here. And DCDV means we put bias on the tip, which forces the charges away from the surface and allows us to image down below the surface. And we see these point things, which turn out to be oxidation centers in the alloy process. So for the first time, this customer could see why their alloy was going bad, because they could see below the surface and see some of the problems that were being caused. Uh, this is a cell measurement. This is a dried endothelial cell wall done in AFM and done in microwave. The microwave just sort of reveals a little bit more stuff going on underneath this, the membrane wall. That's not as dramatic as some of the things I expect we'll be able to do in the future, but it's suggestive of the ability to see into the cell with this instrument. This is a virus receptor array. It's a glass slide with gold metal islands on it. And on those gold metal islands, you put antibodies, which are specific to a given virus. Then you flood it with the sample. And if that virus is present, it'll stick to the antibodies. And so you need some way to detect whether it's stuck or not. Well, the AFM, whoops, sorry about that. The AFM doesn't really see anything. 
because it can't tell. There's some bumps or something, but it can't really tell. The microwave signal can see the difference between gold and virus because the virus is a lossy dielectric and the gold is a conductor. So there's a lot of contrast. Mm -hmm. And if you zoom in into the center of one of those islands, this is the AFM image. And again, you see some bumps. But what of that is gold and what of that is virus? Here, on a two micron by two micron scan, that's a single virus particle. And you see these collections of you know, multiple virus particles in various places. But you see a beautiful contrast, and it's simply because the dielectric properties or the electronic properties of these things are different in this frequency range. So, I am at the end. Microwave network analyzers perform fundamental measurement, which has many uses in the electronics industry, communications, semiconductor, aerospace, defense. But as I've shown you, microwaves have many sensing and imaging application possibilities based primarily on dielectric properties and the physics of water. And we've identified and gone through new application areas of medical, homeland security, process analytics, and these nanoscale nano device measurements. And I spend most of my time working with research groups around the world, trying to you know, build up this research to a critical mass, trying to work with startup companies that are starting to commercialize it and make sure we're in the middle of each one of these with our measurements. So, thank you. <laughs>